Hey everyone, welcome back to another High Yield MCAT Science Explanation. In today's video, I'm going to be walking through the periodic table trends and how it applies not only to like chemistry and some, some, gen, some general chemistry, but also to some physics as well as some organic chemistry and touch on what I think is the most like illuminating topic in the entirety of the Gen Chem on the MCAT. For those of you that don't know me, my name is John. I'm a third year medical student and before I came to medical school, I spent years as a professional MCAT tutor, both freelance, um, working for a couple of the big name companies, and now with this company of my own. This series is where Maggie and myself, who's the other tutor that you'll see on this channel, walk through our high yield MCAT guide and kind of teach through some of the chapters, some of the scaffolding um, for the chapters that we wrote. If you're interested in where to find that book, then it'll be a link in the description, and if you wanna support us, Another way, then go ahead and like this video or subscribe to the channel. We'll really appreciate both. But regardless of whether you do any of that or if you hate me, I'm gonna teach you something. So let's talk about the periodic table. It's the only thing that the MCAT or the AMC is gonna give you on test day. Okay, you don't get a calculator, you don't get to chew gum, you don't get an equation sheet. You, you, there's some clothes you can't even wear. Like I got kicked out one time for wearing a crop top, which is just ridiculous, but it is what it is. But if it's the only tool that they're gonna give you, then it's really important that you kind of familiarize yourself with it and teach yourself how to use that tool to your advantage. So let's learn its trends. So if you look at the whiteboard, then you can see all the trends that I really care about or think are important. And this is a figure that is coming from our book, but you can see um, you know, electron affinity, ionizing, and a lot of these are honestly things that I don't necessarily think are the most high yield, like metallic character, non-metallic character. We'll talk about it, but it's not the most high yield. The most important one is going to be electronegativity. And so, um, it's, some people call it electric negativity, but it's electronegativity. I'm just now noticing this typo. We have a low budget. So let's talk about electronegativity because I think this is actually gonna open up your understanding of some of the physics behind electromagnetism. What is electronegativity? It is the tendency for an atom to attract or hold on to electrons. Now, electrons are these negative charges, right? What attracts negatives? Positives, right? Opposites attract. That's what my parents used to tell me before their divorce. Oh, don't don't include that. Actually, screw it. You know what? Send it. So, where are the positive charges in an atom? It's going to be from the protons. So, if in electric in electronegativity, the discussion is how are we going to attract electrons, then this means how much of a positive charge, how much of this, I'm using force loosely how much of this force from this positive charge can we extend to the electron that we're interested in attracting or holding on to? That's electronegativity. So let's look at this really rudimentary drawing of an electron shell to discuss it. So here in the nucleus, we're gonna have these positive signs are gonna be protons, we've got neutrons for completeness sake, and then this red ring is going to represent the first electron shell. So we should have electrons kind of chilling out here. Now we know that these electrons are staying where they are partially because of this pull from the protons. So they're pulling it closely. Now if we were to add another ring, um, another electron shell, and I understand that not all electron shells are circles, but for this drawing they are, there's still going to be a positive pull from these protons, but it's going to be weaker because there's a broader distance. There's a further radius from this electron shell to this proton. That's the basis for Coulomb's law, which we'll come back to in a little bit. Now the important part, whenever you think about electronegativity, you usually don't really think about the draw of protons on their own electrons, on that element's own electrons. You usually think about it in terms of some random neighboring electron. So how hard um, do, does this proton pull on that electron? How attracted, uh, how attractive is it? And that's really all electronegativity is, right? The whole goal is to pull off this electron and put it into your own valence shell and 
your ability to be able to do that, if you're really good at it, then you are super electronegative. You're very good at attracting electrons, you're super electronegative. If you're not very great at it, then you're not very electronegative. So that trend increases, your electronegativity increases as you go up and to the right on the periodic table. Now there's one notable exception to that, and that is this row right here. The noble gases. So they are not really keen on attracting other electrons because all their valence shells are filled. So they're kind of at peace. They're married. They're not trying to attract anybody else. They shouldn't be. I don't think we have any adulterous noble gases. But regardless, that means that the most electronegative atom is going to be right here, and that's going to be fluorine. So as you go up and to the right, you increase in electronegativity until you reach the noble gases. Now that's something that most people have memorized, but the important part is to understand why is that the case? Why does fluorine have such a huge draw of electrons? And the reason is that there's two ways to increase your draw on electrons. You can either get more positive, so you can add protons, or you can decrease the distance from that electron to your protons. Now the only way that these elements can do that is by decreasing their number of valence shells. And so the reason that fluorine is going to be the most electronegative is because it's in that sweet spot of it's got the most protons it possibly can before it has to either become a noble gas and then kick down to the next row where you add another valence shell. So it has the most protons with the least valence shells possible, which increases the positive pull and decreases the amount of valence shells that are shielding and kind of holding off that pull um, of the electrons. So now it's time for the physics correlate. Don't throw up. But if you remember Coulomb's law, that is that the electrostatic force is equal to K times Q1, which is charge, Q2, which is charge, divided by radius squared. So if we're dividing it by radius squared, that means that if we increase the radius, then our force goes down, right? Because they are on opposite sides of the fraction. So you increase radius, your force goes down. Well, what happens whenever I increase the radius from my nucleus? Well, the force is going to go down, the pull is going to go down. If I'm decreasing that pull, if I'm decreasing that attraction, I'm decreasing the electronegativity. Now this one's actually going to have a bigger impact than the amount of protons, and that's because following Coulomb's law, these are multiplicable, whereas the radius is squared. So even though as you go down in the periodic table, you also increase the amount of protons, you're really increasing the radius from your negative charge to your positive charge, which gets squared, which has a much bigger impact than simply increasing this numerically. That's something called the inverse square law. So electronegativity is really important for gene chem questions. It's gonna help you get a lot of them correct. Like actually understanding how it works and why it works the way that it does, the way that I just explained it, not just understanding that it's up and to the right, even though that'll get you a couple of questions. It's helpful for physics, um, with the Coulomb's equation and, and understanding a little bit more electromagnetism because I, I found that the, the second half of general physics is a little bit more difficult to digest because it's, it's not physical. It's not like dropping a pencil where you can understand like, oh, well, that's gravity. I can see it. It's a little bit more conceptual. Um, so this kind of helps me conceptualize it. But electronegativity is also really important for understanding arrow pushing in organic chemistry. I have managed to memorize probably less than five organic chemistry reactions, and that's just because I, I understand how electronegativity defines arrow pushing. Now, arrow pushing is not something that's high yield on the MCAT, so we're not going to discuss it in this video, but just know that electronegativity makes a big impact on it. The second trend I want to discuss about the periodic table is size. Now the mass on the periodic table is going to be given to you, um, so don't worry about memorizing that. You'll be getting uh, the, the mass, um, the atomic number, and you'll be getting like their abbreviation, like HE for helium. 
But the second dimension of size is the atomic radius. And the atomic radius is the distance from the core of the nucleus to the furthest valence shell electron. So if we are to look here, then the atomic radius would actually be from here to our furthest valence shell electron. Now, you can imagine that atomic radius is going to have a complete inverse relationship with the periodic table as electronegativity does, and that's actually correct. So as you go down and to the left, your atomic radius increases. The reason it does this is because for your valence shells to spread out, they need to be less attracted to the core. So you would want less protons, or I'm sorry, less protons um, attracting the electrons, pulling them in, and you would also want to be in the furthest valence shell possible because valence shells, they kind of like nest on top of each other, and that's going to increase your atomic radius. So that's size, so now we've discussed electronegativity and size. The third trend I want to discuss is ionization energy. This is something that a lot of people don't really completely understand what it is. All ionization energy is, is the energy it takes to dislodge and rip off one of these electrons. Now, it's going to follow the same trends as electronegativity. Does that make sense? Because it kind of should, right? Because if electronegativity is how, how tightly you hold on to the electrons you have and how tightly you attract the others, well, if it's held on really tightly, you're going to need a lot more energy to dislodge it. So that ionization energy is going to go up and to the right. It is not the energy that's released. It is the energy that's required to create an ion. Ionization energy is the energy required to create an ion by ripping off an electron. It's going to increase as you go up and to the right, as you can see highlighted in this chart. And lastly, metallic character. I'll just touch on it briefly. What makes a metal a metal is we're not really talking about like the functional engineering aspect of this, like pliability or strength or tensile strength or anything like this. What we're really talking about is your willingness to lose electrons and become a cation. So a metal, speaking in terms of the periodic table, is something that readily loses cation or readily loses electrons and becomes a cation. And that also is going to follow that down into the left category for the same reason. It has less of this pool, so it's willing to lose its electrons. Out of all these, the big one for you to understand is electronegativity. If you can understand electronegativity and why it works the way that it works, then you are well on your way to having all the trends of the periodic table memorized and earning yourself a couple of free points on the MCAT. Thank you for watching the video. If you learned something or found that I phrased it in a way that you like, please make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and check out the description for links on our, our books, our Discord channel, and our social channels so that you can follow us, study along with us, and secure a high MCAT score while you watch Maggie and myself go through medical school. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.